I'll try to add something new. So first of all, I'll speak very quickly about myself. Uh, I have a background in academia for five years as a university lecturer. So 20 years in IT, mostly 13 in financial industry. Uh, pretty much, uh, I was from the beginning, beginning of 2000, very much involved in uh, Agile and then Lean came DevOps, automation and new technology. Uh, in my current role in Standard Chartered, uh, I'm, doing, I'm doing digital transformation for foundation services, which is data group. So what we will discuss about. So uh, I joined the bank a year and a half ago. So for the project for digital transformation, one of the biggest projects in the bank for enterprise service bus. So we're talking about this, the successes and failure in our journey, uh, what challenges we have in our enterprise environment. So lesson we are learning, learn and still learning as a team and what we try to build next and how we can mitigate the risk. Uh, just very quick, just to understand how many of you are working for en en big enterprises? Okay, so these people relate with my pain. So, and uh, how many of you know about the enterprise service bus? Is it anybody familiar? Okay. Good, so what is enterprise? For the people who are not familiar with this, so what is enterprise service bus? So, as historically, when you start the company, you have one single application. You don't need to talk with any other application. You talk with external clients or it's a website or anything. So, once you start, start adding additional application, you need to communicate one-to-one. -one. At some point, your environment start growing, growing and become similar to mesh. And this is in the case only of the six applications. So instead of each other, we have around 3,000. I mean, not all of them need to speak with each other, but many speak. So, and all these applications speak different languages, different protocols, different, uh, some of them can speak JMS, another can speak XML, somebody speak MQ. So it's created a lot of complexity. So, and to solve this kind of the problem, we're moving to enterprise service bus. So it's considered as middleware, where all application talk with enterprise uh, service bus and service bus basically talk with another application. Uh, Base of the, of the enterprise service bus, it's based on the SOA oriented architecture. This is very popular like 10 years ago. It's still popular in some enterprises. Uh, now everybody moving to the rest with the GraphQL and all the new tech stuff. Uh, but as a bank or many other big enterprises, we're still pretty much stuck with the old, old style. And we're slowly moving to the new, new technology stack. So as an Enterprise service bus is doing two things in our case. It's doing the message transformation and message routing. When we say about, when we talk about the message transformation, we're talking about uh, protocol exchange uh, from one protocol to another. Some application may send XML, another application can consume JSON. So this enterprise bus basically we translate XML to JSON in this case. When it came to the message routing, again, uh, because application as a standard chartered bank is a, across Asia Pacific, it's a global bank. We have different countries. Different countries have different regulations. And again, there's the enterprise uh, bus must know about each country, what a regulation, where to send information, where not to send. Um, and everything that's related to enterprise service bus, you have basically only two players. You have a consumers of the service and you have a providers of the service. And ESB is somewhere in the middle. So this is a very high level general architecture, how it look like. So the consumer talk with uh, integration services, you have a message broker and you have integration manager caching or management layer, which is talk to the database. So in some cases you write your Audi data into database, uh, or any other platform. Um, message broker usually routes the messages. Integration service take functional services and you have a services basically publish there and do the routing internally as well. <coughs> so a year and a half ago when I joined the company, so the project already was around three years old. 
and already mostly implemented, but we identify a lot of problems. Uh, in financial industry, you have a term of the criticality of application. So you have BCP1, 2, 3, 5, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to the 5. So the 5 considered one of the most, most critical piece of the software in the bank. In the, so this means uh, it's pretty highly regulated by MAS. So you can have a downtown, uh, downtown. You have a down, you, you may have your application down around for four hours in a year. Everything, any single, uh, any single uh, problem with the application will need to be reported to regulators. So, uh, and uh, EDMI, Enterprise Message Bus, is one of these applications. And just to understand the complexity, every time you go to the ATM machine, so you put your credit card or debit card, basically to send the messages through Enterprise Bus. So it will send a few messages to different systems, one for iBanking, for example, retail, check your accounts, another will send your risk, just in case if you use your credit card like five minutes ago in, in Cambodia, or and now you to try to, on, to do the online banking from Singapore, so basically this is a high risk. So this kind of the complexity is there. So that's why is, it's very critical. So, and in order to accommodate this criticality and the high availability of application, we, we saw to fix two problems, basically organizational problem and technological problem. Uh, when we arrived, we saw few problems so with the teams. It was classical, traditional waterfall model approach on the development, was project-centric delivery, so basically no clear ownership, um, no, pro no program or portfolio governments uh, level, so we didn't have a clear, everything was kept in Excel files. All the services, what it publishes. And sometimes you have a multiple version of it, and it was pretty messy. Uh, narrow specialization of the team, even in the development, we have a team who is managing infrastructure, a team actually who developing the services, and they've been aligned based on the domain specific level. Uh, then every single delivery, it took around two to four weeks. Even if you have one line change in your code, you'll need to wait around three weeks to deploy it in production, just be because of the paper heavy deployment. And the team is pretty big, it's around, around 100 people, it's a 70 developers, so it's quite big. Uh, almost no automation, very, very little basic shell scripts automation. Uh, as a factory and organizational side, uh, additionally, the environment, how historically it was structured, was uh, very inefficient of use of resources. So even though we had enough capacity to accommodate, uh, all most of the project historically only few projects was using the specific infrastructure or the more precise of virtual boxes that was used and uh, and uh, this lead actually to the all the projects share the common infrastructure only few infrastructure boxes was used the conflicting deployments each project have maybe some specific configuration types if one project changed basically the rest of the projects would suffer um, Biggest, again, the problem was the development or infrastructure team didn't have absolutely no control over development environment. One example would be if your application user account was locked, you need to raise a ticket to another team, and sometimes you may need to wait two days just to reset your ticket in development environment. So extremely heavy processes. Everything needed to be was a BMC ticket or a Jira ticket, Remedy ticket. So it was very, very heavy. Uh, from technology stack side, so we had we, we discovered a few scripts which is more or less running and most of the time didn't. So no automation or provisioning of infrastructure at all because people didn't have a right access. So manual code deployment for the web interface, click, click, click. Uh, again, manual infrastructure maintenance, if you had like partition with the logs field, you usually find from your consumers and providers who complain that the message doesn't run. So, and then you go, and until you find that actually it's a log created problem or the disk space, right? So it took another two to four hours just to figure out that there's something wrong. So no monitoring and alerting, obvious. So this is the challenge which we start facing a year and a half ago. Um, 
this is approximation is a, is a factory model. So only a few teams, each team try to, even if you have enough infrastructure, basically they still try to share. And again, it's the reason was behind it because the, these virtual boxes had access to the, for example, the firewall was open for external consumers and providers. For example, if you use uh, Google Pay or Apple Pay, Alipay, so usually in order to do the testing with your clients, you need to have access. And once you stuck with this, in, with this infrastructure, you, you don't want to move. So it's great if you don't have any automated model, so it's become very difficult to move to any new, new infrastructure site. Uh, so we had pretty dining difficult uh, problem to solve. So we focus on a few things. We needed a new organizational model. So we couldn't implement any automation if your underlying organization is not strong <coughs> enough to support you. So all your efforts in automate will fail. So first, what we decided, no manual code deployment from development up to production. So no manual infrastructure maintenance. This means everything will need to be monitored and to be automated, clean up whatever is will re require. Uh, and because of the, uh, it's a vendor driven application, enterprise is not an in house development. And we usually lacking behind two, three years from development newer version, newer patches. So in any deployment, it's usually take like six to 10 months, a new version, even if it's a minor one. Uh, because of the dependency of the consumers and providers, you need to test everything. Uh, and we decided to look for the new technology stack for the enterprise service bus. Uh, the first thing what we did, we start looking into implementing agile frameworks, agile methodologies. So we start looking into the base on the, on the scale agile frameworks. So because of the size of the team, uh, focused on the product centric business domain delivery. So we need to have a very clear definition, defined program and delivery levels. For example, we try to, to get much more collaboration, uh, we implemented the Kanban, but not the Scrum. One of the reasons of the Kanban, that because of the size of the team and experience with agile frameworks, will be much more easier to implement Kanban than Scrum. So in addition to the type of the work that was done there, it's more linear. Uh, as the teams are involved in the project, they're not self-sustained. They usually depend on the consumers and providers. And the consumers and providers usually manage the pace of the development. So, and Kanban, it was much better suited in, the, in our case than the Scrum. And we start working basically towards the DevOps automated everything as a culture for the team. So this was a very, very hard push from the leads up to the team members who do the coding. Uh, uh, we didn't have any, any testing framework. So we start developing a testing framework, specs by example, for example, or ATDD. Uh, we didn't have any catalog. As I mentioned, we had Excel sheets, different versions, very big. We didn't contain any relevant or any information that real, real time information, what, what we were running in the production and what actually we're having uh, in, the, this, uh, in this Excel sheet. So we, we developed the service catalog, which will be com directly linked to the production system. It will be automatically updated once anything is released in production. Uh, we build continuous delivery pipeline using the Jenkins and streamline our release management. Uh, we, in order to go to the big bank, so it was a very big change for the teams and all the depend on the consumers and providers. So we couldn't afford, because again, of the criticality, uh, and from the, if you look from a release management perspective, I think the 30%, 30 to 40% on the weekly uh, deployments of the bank, it was this team was doing it. So if you think around 3,000 application and 30% of the load of the deployments in the bank is done by one single team. Because everybody tried to change something, reuse some services or deploy new services. So. <sighs> We split it into the phases. So we put the three basic phases. One, we try to decouple. The first number one, we try to stabilize environment for development to work properly, to not conflict with each other. So we decouple infrastructure based on domain. We have a domain like wealth, security, risk, 
uh, which is have very, very type of the packages that they deploy, a very similar classification part. Uh, this help us to efficiently manage resource utilization. We get control over the development environment. This is first thing what we did. We fight it for, with uh, our uh, Unix team to get a root access to the boxes. We need full control. We couldn't afford to wait for it. It took a while, but we get it. Uh, we automated most of the tasks, which is, was done manually. So it was pretty straightforward, one-to-one. -one. Each team had uh, their own environment. They work on the, basically they have their own VMs they could deploy. Uh, another step was done, we just start training the teams. They start getting ownership, what they run in the development. They also should support, if they have a problem, they need to try to fix it. The phase number two, we implemented continuous deployment using the Ansible. Uh, it's a vendor product which was probably developed initially in the 90s, so it's, everything was pretty manual, so it took some time to, to make it Ansible. Ansible work with it. We implement continuous integration using the Jenkins, uh, implementing the source control system with a bit bucket inside the bank. So we split the configuration level and the, uh, and the source, source levels because of the different life, life cycle management. We further decouple our common components uh, first thing we did, we implemented the proper monitoring solution. We already had the ITRS, Genius, if you're familiar, running in the bank. And we start, we implemented the Elastic stack with the Kibana for logging and analytics. Uh, approximately this was how was looking after we, after the second phase, we had a f in front of the reverse proxy. So we try to abstract direct communication for the teams and users to connect to the service. We try to go for reverse proxy. Uh, Elastic would take uh, over the analytics. Previously, we ship all our analytics into the Oracle database and it was very heavy. If you want to query something for more complicated query, it took around 10 to 20 minutes to query for any data. So once with Elastic, it took less than a second, maybe one second. So it big improvement there. So we start using the Git and Artifactory where we can publish our, our artifacts. Uh, on the phase three that we are working now, so uh, the main problem with the big enterprise application, they try to do everything for everybody. And usually when you try to do this, it doesn't work very well. So because each team, more mature the team, they need more specialization, they need more specific use cases that it doesn't work so. And at some point we realized it, that we are, uh, we are the bottleneck for many teams to evolve. So they need to comply with our own processes because we are in the middle. So our idea now is to build infrastructure as a code that to give the team, each team possibility to deploy their own integration servers as they need instead of coming to us and begging for different changes. So we'll give this possibility, only possibility with a new tech stack, which could be the Docker Kubernetes, now we're working. Uh, we try to move ahead with a continuous deployment into production with Ansible, and though, uh, if you remember, this is a BCP5 application, it is quite challenging. Again, Ansible, Randa, Kubernetes. Uh, we try to shift, we work with our support team, operation team, we try to shift the focus from Stability that never worked historically. We tried to shift to recoverability. Uh, and we tried to move towards uh, the model. So you build it, you run it. As Andrew mentioned, uh, Werner Wogel in 2006 speech. So basically we tried to go in the same direction. So we tried to build more on the face. So we'll be running in the Kubernetes clusters it will be completely auto-deployed. Each namespace will be per project. Each container we run one single service. So because the technology of the Kubernetes allow us to do the re replication model, we can replicate as many as you need in your YAML definition file, or replication controller side. It's allow, you, allow us much more flexibility and reliability. We can do the canary deploys, so or blue-green, Deployment, we can shift the traffic 30% to make sure one of the environment is stable enough and then can switch the rest of the, of the Kubernetes cluster for the specific service. Challenges. So this is, was a 
so we had tons of challenges and still having it, probably will have it. So one of the challenges we face was front to back integration projects I executed using traditional waterfall model. So it's not, we're not talking about any more uh, enterprise service bus team, we're talking about the consumers and providers. Yeah. So consumers and providers, sometimes slow, some consumers <coughs> could be very fast, but you as fast as your slowest consumer and provider. You cannot go faster. Uh, incremental delivery very challenging. So we try to introduce agile release tra train model. This should mitigate this part. Uh, again, we have a huge wall between delivery and operation teams. Again, it's a classical. Anything to be done is go for very tedious process of documentation with need to specify every single line. So it's create a lot of headaches. Uh, we try to bring operation in development. Recently we start working very close with the operation team. Basically they now become part of the development. So we identify a few champions from the operation team which we work day to day basically with the development and they, they, they spread knowledge further. Uh, again, we don't have much adequate tooling for the supporting CICD. So again, it's uh, manual deployment does take a lot of time. We try to use moving from Ansible now more to the Kubernetes model. Uh, if your infrastructure, you treat it as a pets, Ansible probably will not be the best answer. So Ansible is stateless. We saw a few issues during deployment in production. Uh, many things that you assume you're in your playbooks it will not work if your infrastructure is it's like you treat it as a pets. If you cannot spin it or bootstrap it. So we saw, we had a few issues with, with uh, with Ansible, so Kubernetes probably will solve us because it's abstract all this complexity. Uh, we didn't have any uh, performance monitoring tools. Now we're looking into a few, few possibilities. Uh, we implemented Elastic Stack in production, so now we're moving to complete audit log. Everything is done in Elastic. Uh, for development environment, uh, very shortly soon, I think maybe in the next few weeks, we are going into production to complete audit side. Uh, one of the challenges of the human resource uh, level, uh, most of the team are located outside of Singapore, so it's very difficult to find the champions inside the team who can drive the challenge, drive the change. So one of the big challenges, everybody usually is pretty much compliant. You tell them what to do, they will do it, but exactly you need the people who can drive it. So this is one of the challenges, so we try to hire the right people for the job. Budgeting is a big problem as well for us. Uh, if you want to try to be agile, or lean in your mindset. So you, you try to de decide as, uh, as late as possible. In order to decide as late as possible, you cannot do it with the current in enterprise budgets. Because usually how the budget works, in the beginning of the year or in the end of the year, you provision or you think what you will do the next year. And you need to spend as much as possible because just in case, because next year we'll not get the money. So, and this has created a lot of problems because you don't know how, what you will build exactly. So you may have some ideas, but or you do over-provisioning or under-provisioning. And if you do over-provisioning, probably you will get something, but it doesn't make sense anymore because you may change your mind. Or under-provisioning, your new option, your, your new technology you may choose may not be covered <coughs> and become political. Again, another challenge, it's a vertical organizational structure. So example will be, for example, the support model development team are all ended up at CIO level. So if you need anything to be done across the team and you don't have authority, only aut authority person who has a CEO is a global CEO. So if I want to complain, I need to go up to the higher letter, which probably is not do, do the case. So uh, from the organizational side, we need more of probably horizontal teams who has more power to change. Uh, another, another Another point what, I, what we, we saw in the, in the enterprise level companies, the teams who are less independent of the global enterprise application are most efficient and fastest in development. So we try to abstract for the model, bring one big application that support every single thing for everybody. We try to go very small. If you want to move fast, you can not rely on the global application. So we try to bring our own application. We try to manage it and try to deploy it. So that's it for, we still have a lot, we end just in the beginning. So we have a lot of work to be done and wish us good luck. <laughs>
Ja.